Hi everyone, uh, good, good evening and in some cases good afternoon and welcome to our July Well and Good talk. Um, I'm Jesse Van Amberg, I'm the Senior Food and Health Editor and I will be your host and moderator for this evening. So it's an indisputable fact that the world we live in is fundamentally different than it was just six months ago. We're still grappling with a deadly pandemic that has claimed the lives of over 600,000 people worldwide and cost millions of workers their jobs and incomes. Mask wearing and social distancing is the norm, or at least it should be, and hand washing has never been cooler. At the same time, many of the issues also coming to the forefront in 2020, namely the realities of systemic racism, have existed long before this particular moment. But the existing strain of the COVID-19 pandemic, combined with the unjust police killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other Black Americans, has created a long overdue urgency around racial justice that has spread to nearly every part of society. But wait, you're probably asking at this point in time, aren't we talking about food tonight? Yes, but we can't talk about healthy eating in this moment without acknowledging the profound impact the pandemic and racism have had on what we eat and why. Food is bigger than just what you put on your plate. It is shaped by our cultures, our values, and our circumstances, and what we value, how we live, and what is considered to be worthy of the cultural mainstream are all being re-examined in this moment. We're at an inflection point, and the truism, you are what you eat, has never meant more than right now. So where do we go from here, and how will this moment shape how we eat going forward? I'm very excited to discuss all of these topics with our incredible panelists tonight, with whom I am incredibly grateful to share this virtual stage. They are, drum roll please, Maya Feller, a registered dietitian nutritionist and nationally recognized nutrition expert based in Brooklyn, New York. Camilla Marcus, the chef and founder of Westbourne and the co-founder of Relief Opportunities for All Americans, a group whose mission is to advocate for small restaurant businesses devastated by COVID-19, support restaurant workers, and help create a path to a sustainable future for the hospitality industry in New York. Next, we have Dr. Ebony Butler, a psychologist and food relationship strategist who has made it her mission to help women of color heal and thrive in the areas of trauma and diet recovery. And last but absolutely not least, we have Navina Khanna, the director of Heal Food Alliance, a national coalition representing over 2 million food industry workers, from farmers to public health advocates and organizers, with a goal of transforming food systems to be fair to workers and producers while protecting the environment and being healthy, accessible, and affordable for all. Hers is the foundation that you all donated to tonight in order to attend this panel, and we're very grateful for her your donations. So before we dive into this big topic, because we have a lot on our virtual plates that we have to discuss tonight, I wanted to do some quick, quick housekeeping. Um, so we will be talking for about 45, for the next 45 or so minutes, um, and we'll have some Q&A in the last 10 minutes of our session. So if you would like to ask a question, you can click the Q&A button that should be, I believe, at the bottom of your Zoom window, and you can just type in your questions there. Um, we'll do our best to answer what we can in the time remaining. I also wanted to point your attention to the chat function, which is also at the bottom of your Zoom window um, that you can type in to kind of share your comments and thoughts um, throughout the panel as various topics come up. However, please keep it respectful. Anyone who shares racist, hateful, or harassing remarks will be removed by our moderator. So keep it cool, please. Um, so, um, to dive into this very large um, series of topics we have to discuss, I wanted to first ask our panelists, starting with Maya, um, how have our vastly changed lifestyles and circumstances due to COVID-19 impacted what and how we eat? Are there any trends you're seeing in consumer behavior that have risen up since the pandemic? And so first for Maya. So I just want to start by saying I'm so honored to be here with this fantastic panel and uh, what a great question. Um, so I thought about this, right, because I think if we had asked this question three months earlier, I would have given a different answer, 
right? So at the beginning of the pandemic, what we saw was, you know, every, kind of various parts of the nation went on pause or like into a shutdown. And then that had a financial ramification, right? Like this huge ripple effect where we saw people either losing their work, reducing their work, and then the people were working from home, right? So then there was also remote schooling and then there was also homeschooling, right? So the two are like completely different. Um, and then there were families who, for the people that were able to stay at home, had these altered work schedules, right? So maybe they were going in because they were essential workers, um, or maybe you know they had jobs that required them to leave the home, but everyone's schedules were upside down. As all of this is happening, right? Some folks are able to get food delivered to their house, all their groceries delivered. Some folks have to go out to the grocery store to get their food. We're starting to see food prices rise, right? There's a, a, a multitude of reasons for why this is happening. And then that's having this direct impact on the people at home in terms of how they purchase and procure their food, what they purchase and what they prepare. So there's been this shift toward you know, cost conscious shopping and also things if people are in these, you know, larger family settings and also even the smaller family settings to stretch the meal, right? Because it's really important when we're thinking about sitting down to the table to not have something that costs so much money, you know, in one sitting because finances are really kind of front of mind for so many of us right now. So I've seen that. In the beginning, folks were baking and they were making everything from scratch, right? We saw all over social media and, you know, people were like, you know, making their own mothers and sourdough bread and pasta. And now there is fatigue, right? We have seen that this is a long haul. This is the new norm. So the question is, at least among a lot of my patients, how do we now navigate this new food normal where it's clear for some people that there will be this continued work from home at least through 2021 for those that are still going out and have jobs they're on reduced schedules right what does that look like from a financial perspective and then how do you feed yourself and if you've got a large family how do you do that without the burnout right because we're making breakfast lunch and dinner for ourselves our children you know ourselves our partner and so the shift has now been how do we navigate this landscape while also feeling good right and i didn't even get as a dietitian i didn't even get into this whole idea of what do you do if you're managing a chronic illness right if we're thinking about what does food look like from that context i could go on and on <laughs> um because i believe that this answer changes on the day to day mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I know from the well and good point of view in terms of what our readers really responded to, I, it mirrors a lot of what you just mentioned in terms of like at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone really, really wanted to know how to use all those beans that they bought. Uh, everyone really wanted to know how to make banana bread, you know, kind of like dealing with those staples. But now that we've been living like this for quite a period of time, much longer, I think, than many people expected, I think now there's sort of, to your point, this like, oh God, <laughs> now what do I do, you know? Um, and I also wanted to ask this question to Dr. Butler because when we were discussing this um, last week, you had a really interesting point about, um, from your perspective as a trauma expert, you had a really interesting point about like our, our eating habits in general and how they're kind of informed by the stress of this particular moment. Would you mind speaking to that a little bit, Dr. Butler? Yes, and uh, like Maya, I'm so excited to be here and excited to share this conversation. So I do look at many things through a trauma lens, and this pandemic is a trauma for a lot of people, for all of us, actually. We're sitting right dead smack in the middle of a crisis, um, and crisis is trauma. So when we're talking about ways to get through this, and we're talking about ways to actually manage this, for a lot of people, their set of coping skills centers around food. Um, and so when you're talking about, pri primarily, when we're talking about ways to get through this and the impact that that has had, so if your body is constantly in fight, flight, or freeze mode, because that is what happened at the beginning, I mean, all of us were kind of like, oh my God, what is happening? We're going to rush to the store and get all of the food, and we're going to make sure that our houses are stopped. We're making choices that necessarily aren't rational because we're making them from a survival standpoint. 
And so you have all of these foods that are available to you. Now, many people have food that is stocked in their houses that may not have been stocked before because we're typically on the go, we're at work more. And so what happens then is that food also, that being food being so accessible now, can also serve as a trigger for a lot of people too. It's like, what do I do? I'm not used to this much food being here. I don't really know how to manage. I'm used to managing my relationship with food, managing the things that are going on in my life with a lot of other things, but I don't really have those available to me anymore. So what do I do? And so having all of those things around kind of helps kind of sends us into the space where we're not, A, we're not thinking in the most rational ways because of what's happening. And then you throw our typical coping skills into the mix with everything being shut down. The, the things that we would typically ask our clients to do is to kind of go outside, take a walk, take a break. I mean, we can't do any of that. So you're just kind of like in the house. And so when you're experiencing trauma, one of the things that you want to do is find safety. Some people find safety in food. Some people find security in food. And so those things are readily available. And so going to those seems more likely. And then we want to throw the shame and the guilt in that social media tends to kind of put on people for like steer clear of the weight gain. And then so people now are then coping with food to, to deal with that shame, to deal with that guilt and trying to kind of soothe themselves out of feeling bad for the things that they're eating, for the sourdough bread that they're making, for the pizza that they're making with their families, because nobody really knows what's right or wrong. We've never had to deal with this. And so people are trying to navigate a trauma with some type of direction and there's type of there's advice coming from every different place. And so a lot of that stuff can be re-traumatizing. We're dealing with packed on shame. And also the last point that I'll make is that when we're in the middle of a trauma, our bodies and our minds remembers earlier traumas. And so things start to come back that we thought maybe were dormant or we thought maybe were resolved because our brain latches on to similar trauma experiences and feelings. Those things also come rushing back. So now we're people are dealing with crisis present day, and we're dealing with things that have happened in the past. And so you talk about kind of creating a healthy relationship with food, coping from that lens is very difficult. And there's a lot of pressure and a lot of things that we don't typically take into consideration when we're thinking about just getting through this pandemic. Absolutely. And I think to your point, you know, there's been a lot of really horrible memes going around on social media that, you know, may seem harmless at first glance of like, oh, no, the quarantine 15 and, you know, things like that, that might just seem like a joke. But I think to your point, so many people have been now they're kind of like at home all the time. They're very aware of the food they have. And, you know, maybe they had been actively healing from disordered eating patterns or they're developing new ones because now there there aren't any you know real coping mechanisms and it's it's so unfortunate that kind of in the middle of this global pandemic where people's people are losing their jobs and people are you know like struggling figuring out how to feed themselves and trying to stay healthy and safe like the thought is like god forbid we lose weight you know like that's kind of the when there's many 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 more pressing problems you know Absolutely. And I think that those things, as we talk about kind of our foundation of things, I talk to you, I think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so mm -hmm. we're talking about security and safety. Those are our, find, um, our foundational pieces. And self-actualization is kind of at the top. So for us to be able to be doing all the things that many of us were doing pre-COVID, pre-quarantine, then we're still expected to maintain that same level of self-actualization. It's not realistic, but we're, you know, society we are placing that amount of pressure on ourselves, but really what we're driven towards when we're kind of thinking about how our bodies are navigating trauma, we're literally trying to find safety and security and trying to make those blocks stable again. And I think mm -hmm. that when people are placing these expectations on people and when we internalize those, we're not remembering that survival, we're trying to survive here. And the idea around weight gain, your body, when you're going through a trauma, your body is not going to lose weight. Um, if your body is completely stressed, if your body is solely thinking about safety. So these are the things that we constantly have to be kind of keeping at the forefront of our minds. Something I'm always talking to my clients about is like, think about it. We're in the middle of a crisis, a mass event. Mm -hmm. And what we're thinking about is how many steps we got in. That's, that's, not, that's not typically um, how things go and your body's not going to function that way. So we have to think of our bodies in that regard. And give yourself a break too. Yes. I have to jump in because I completely agree. And I've been saying to my patients that, you know, this is a time where we've lost so much and where so many primary needs are not being met. 
And in fact, I think it is incredibly damaging for the memes to be going around and for this unnecessary focus, you know, of weight loss to be placed in the midst of all of this. So I completely agree. I talked to my patients about, you know, how do you figure out how to navigate the now and where we are mm -hmm. rather than saying, I'm going to further restrict myself when we've lost so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd love to jump in on that too, if, if that's okay, Jesse. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I really agree with everything that both of you are saying around how folks are responding in their homes and even the trajectory that we've seen for people over time. I think the other thing that's been just really inspiring to me and continues to be really inspiring to me is how in times of crisis, and we see this around the world, whether it's climate catastrophes or war or whatever, that in those times of crisis, community also pulls together. And part of what I've really witnessed over the last few months, and I'm sure you all have seen this in your communities too, is that um, people are recognizing that there's, there's no one else out there that's gonna save us. We pull through this by pulling together. Um, so for example, in Oakland, we're seeing like black and Asian farmers who are growing produce and dropping it off at the local church and neighbors who are taking turns preparing the food and cooking it and delivering it to unhoused folks, right? To make sure that people all have enough food to eat. Um, I was just talking to a friend earlier today who was saying the same thing in Minneapolis where in, young indigenous folks are cooking together to feed native elders um, in the community. And in the beginning, a lot of people were starting to plant their gardens and make the sourdough bread and things like that that folks have spoken to already. And, um, and they're also sharing it more with each other, right? So growing food and then taking it to their neighbors um, or taking the homemade food to each other or sharing recipes and so on. And I, I feel really inspired by the way that um, people are recognizing it's not just about me. It's like, we're in this together. together. Yeah, so, like, yeah, I'll, like, jump, I'll jump in on that if you don't mind. You know, yeah. in some ways I agree. And in some ways, um, you know, speaking as someone in the restaurant business, one in four people unemployed right now come from our business with no end in sight. Our industry has not received one specific level of aid at any level of government, yet we dominate unemployment which is only further adding to the food insecurity. We already had a food insecurity problem in our country, especially in New York where I'm based. And now we're adding an entire industry um, to that. And you know, I can't speak around, around the country, but in New York specifically, the cracks are starting to show. And I think what you said about Maslow's hierarchy of needs is spot on. So many in our industry, you know, we have family meals. So many people eat on the job and are taken care of. Uh, bring stuff home to their kids, to their families. We don't have that anymore. And I think what you're seeing in addition is this huge stratification. Um, you know, and it's it's really brutal to see. And yes, as a community, we've banded together. We've done so much to try and help. I mean, Roar, we raised already a million dollars for cash direct cash assistance. But even trying to do that was very hard. I think people are forgetting that, you know, we can't work from home. And, you know, I ask lawmakers regularly, you know, when's the last time you hired someone who didn't graduate high school or who didn't go to college? We don't have a lot of jobs available to this industry. And so I do think as far as food, you know, the food movement and thinking about, um, you know, base level needs, I very much stay up at night thinking about what's going to happen to our social services, to our food system and to our food access when, you know, we employ a million people in New York alone restaurants. What happens when those million people now are fully on the system? Um, it's, we're not really prepared for that. Yeah, this was actually, that's such a great point, Camilla. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And that leads into my next question, which is going to be, which is for you, um, kind of to elaborate, especially since, you know, the um, unemployment extra federal government benefits expire um, very soon at the, um, on July 31st. And so obviously this will mean that people, you know, many, you know, people who had been unemployed and who still can't find work, whose jobs are still closed are now going to lose like a, a big source of income. And it's unclear what that, you know, next step will be, you know, Congress is debating on it, but, you know, TBD on what that, you know, what that assistant will look like and how, how meaningful it would be. And so I'd love for you to kind of talk about a bit more kind of like unpack for us a little bit more how kind of, how this, kind of this economic, economic impacted the restaurant industries and from where you sit? 
we've been decimated. I mean, we're amongst the hardest hit. You know, we it's in fact illegal in this country to sell food commercially from your home. So I love to remind lawmakers that it's actually illegal for us to work from home, unlike a lot of other industries. Um, and like I said, it also is so hinge, hinging on, you know, the types of people that we do, you know, we do employ and who are in our community. You know, so I think we're the top employer of single mothers. If you think about, you know, the diversity within our, our teams across the country, you know, small, I always say collectively, we seem like small businesses are, you know, individually, we seem like small businesses, but collectively, we're, we employ 11 million country. Like I said, 10% of those are in New York alone. Um, we are there from lawmakers is, oh, well, why help? yours, you know, to which I say, well, you already helped airlines, you already helped cruises, and we employ more people in New York than airlines. Um, and the ability of our people getting alternative employment, you know, in a recession, in a pandemic, you know, it's hard to interview for a job remotely. It's hard to get one. And especially if this is what you've dedicated your career to, you know, it's not that easy just to jump to something else. So, um, you know, it is it is a real concern, like I said, and I think a lot of these safety net measures have been extraordinary and a big step forward, but it's also delaying the inevitable, which is the government still doesn't have a plan. Um, it's one of the reasons that, so I'm also a member of the Independent Restaurant Coalition, uh, one of the founding members, and we've been pushing the Restaurant Act. So if you go to saverestaurants.com, you can see all the reports that data. Um, it's pretty shocking and scary. And, you know, the clock's ticking and we're really running out of time to come up with a plan to save, you know, not only 11 million jobs, but, you know, you know I know it's part of her world. That's not even including our supply chain, the millions of farmers, growers, makers, suppliers, small businesses that rely on restaurants in our ecosystem that we all are interdependent on. Um, it's a huge swath of people that right now have not received appropriate aid. And, you know, you look at the numbers, we invest 90% on the dollar back into the economy, back in our communities, back into our neighborhoods. Um, so it's, it's high time um, that, you know, the country and the government look to see what kind of aid we can provide. And, you know, right now, like I said, we've got the Restaurant Act um, up in the House and the Senate, um, and we need all the help we can get to get it to the finish line in these coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking to that. Um, and that leads into, because you alluded to it, so that leads into my next question for Navina. So kind of outside of the restaurant industry, what are some of the most pressing issues in our food system that you, um, from where you sit, that COVID-19 has exacerbated? Yeah, so here's the thing is the U.S. food system is it's based on white supremacy and on this culture that values profit more than life, right? It was founded on land theft from native people on farms that were tended by kidnapped and enslaved people from Africa. And it was designed from the very beginning to benefit a select few at the expense of everybody else. Um, and we're seeing the corporations that have benefited to date fight to maintain their stranglehold on that system, right? So we're seeing it especially impact food system workers who, um, Camila already spoke to this, but Across the country, 21.5 million people work in our food system. That's from farm to, to grocery store to table. Um, and even before the pandemic, they had seven of the worst paying jobs in the country. And about half of those workers are restaurant workers, right? Many of them depend on tipped wages. Um, but the, while restaurant workers cannot go to work right now, the rest of the food system workforce is considered essential workers and is mandated to go to work, right? So to go to work on farms and to go to work in meat processing plants and to go to work in grocery stores. And the majority of those workers are Black, Latinx, Asian workers. Um, they're not being given the protections that they need in order to survive in the workplace. And they're literally being forced to choose right now between their lives and their livelihoods. So what we're seeing now is that, I think the numbers today put it over 45,000 or maybe 46,000 um, workers across the food system who have tested positive for COVID. And this, that, that number is minuscule compared to the millions of people now today who have tested positive, but these are preventable. Um, it's preventable because these companies could be giving workers six feet of space, right? They could be giving workers 
face coverings. They could be ensuring that people can take breaks or have sick leave if they've been exposed to COVID. Um, they're doing none of those things and the federal government has actually exempted those companies from uh, having to take any responsibility to make sure that their workers are safe. They don't have to comply with CDC guidelines. There is no OSHA standard to protect them. Um, we've seen mass outbreaks in meat packing plants around the country and the media talks about it as if it's about maintaining our meat supply. But the reality is that the majority of that meat is getting exported to other countries. It's not even feeding people in this country. Um, about almost 40,000 have been meatpacking workers and about 4,500 are farm workers. We know that's just gonna grow on farms because harvest season is happening now. Farm workers are packed into tight housing. There's no way to stop the spread um, unless folks are given the protections that they need in order to take care of themselves. So um, just as Camila shared about some of the, the stuff that um, they're working on around the Restaurant Act, which is super important. I just also wanna highlight that we're fighting to get uh, enforceable standards by OSHA um, to make sure that workers are protected across the system. And I'll drop, a, I'll drop a link into the chat where folks can go for more information about this. But um, if we can get the HEROES Act passed, it includes that. Um, and then there's some state by state uh, campaigns also to try to get governors to take action in their own states because the federal government is not taking action in the ways that we need. And I wanted to add one thing to Navina because I totally agree. And I think the big failing also has been government infrastructure. I mean, here in New York, it was impossible to get PPE for a while and we kept clamoring and hammering the government, fix the supply chain, make it free, even now to get testing and rapid testing. I mean, we really need to be putting science first and you know, there are a lot of clear reasons why that's not happening, but even in major cities, like I said, 10% of restaurants and a lot of the food service workers that you mentioned, like I said, are concentrated in a few states and they still haven't figured out how to make that access. I mean, it really should be a no brainer in the US. We've now had months and it's still not worked out. And I agree with you and we've been pushing incredibly hard at all levels because it's, it's not okay. And, you know, there was, I keep saying, we had one Senator who got, um, who got COVID and they broke Congress, right? And yet, you know, minimum wage workers are supposed to go to work the next day regardless. I mean, it's, it's a total sham. I completely agree with you, Dina. It's, it's pretty awful. Yeah, I absolutely. Um, and I, I could talk all day about this, but unfortunately we have to move on to our next question, but I think that's such a salient point. And yes, um, we will be, for folks who are interested in supporting these initiatives, um, we will be putting those links in the chat. Um, and I believe you'll get an email afterwards with kind of everybody's, um, everybody's like organizations that they work with and stuff so that you, you can, you know, continue the work at home. But um, yeah, it's, it's especially since, you know, to everyone's point, like essential, the, you know, food workers are considered essential workers, but they're not being paid like essential workers and they're not being treated like essential workers. And it's, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking and, and frustrating. Um, so of course, as if 2020, you know, couldn't be enough, as I alluded to my, in my, you know, opening remarks, we already have a pandemic that's putting massive strain on society. And then on top of that, um, in June, we had, we, and we've continued to have protests for weeks um, be sparked by the unjust killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other Black Americans by police. Um, and thankfully, these protests have brought urgency that has been long needed to recognize and address racism at every level of society. And while it started talking about, you know, police brutality, um, this, these conversations have trickled out into, I would say, almost every part of society, including food and nutrition. Um, so kind of with this context in mind, um, Maya, I'd love to ask you, as a nutrition practitioner, how does racism shape and impact how we understand and interact with what is defined as healthy food? That's a major and massive question. A million dollar question. <laughs> My gosh, I know. I mean, I thought about this and I've been thinking, I mean, I've been thinking about it for I think as long as I've been a dietitian, right? Because, you know, coming into dietetics, um, you know, less than 3% of all dietitians are black. So it means that our field is overwhelmingly white. Um, so that's one part of it. To the first part of what you said, Jesse, right? Because there's always been this racial hierarchy in this country, coupled with, you know, really a class and caste system, 
it's impossible to separate racism and food systems and health. It's impossible, right? Because they're all entered exactly, right? It is completely intertwined, right? So if we know that the way that the food systems were set up in this country were on the backs of black and brown people and indigenous people on stolen land, right? And if we know the way that we talk about health is from a white, cisgendered, heterosexual male perspective, then that means when we're talking about health and what is healthy, we're always lining up against this one white male gaze as the barometer, when in fact it's not, right? So it's what I could, when, so when I teach and we talk about social determinants of health in my class, and I even went in on the textbook, like I had a talk with the folks who wrote the textbook and I said, you know, part of the problem with the way that our texts are written, right, for all the practitioners is that we perpetuate the bias. The textbook will say, Black people are more likely to develop X disease. Latina, well, they say Latino. So Latino people, no, they don't. They say Hispanic, excuse me. Hispanic people are more likely to get X disease. But there's never a discussion about the why. They don't talk about the variables that are needed to express health, and they don't ever talk about communities, right? When we look at neighborhoods, right, and we think about grocery stores and we think about full service grocery stores, and then you go back and you layer on top of that, well, who's living in that zip code? What's the socioeconomic status of the people living there? What is the racial category of those people living there? What we see is that black and brown neighborhoods, time and time again, they are redlined, grocery stores are gone, dollar stores move in, and then people are blamed for having higher rates of diabetes. They are blamed for having heart attacks. They are blamed for having breast cancer. If we look at the statistics around breast cancer, black women are more likely to die from breast cancer. However, we're not as likely to develop breast cancer. So that means when we look at all of these things about health, people of color time and time again have limited access to all of the variables that allow us to express health, every single variable. We have limited access to quality health care. Our neighborhoods are over-policed. We are violently reprimanded, right? We don't have schools that are well-funded. We don't have playgrounds that are safe for us to move our bodies, right? I have, not me, let's say I have high blood pressure and I want to move my body, but I can't go outside safely to do so. That's going to exacerbate my condition. So every single variable is stacked against us. So when I think about health and nutrition and what it, what racism in the nutrition sphere looks like, it's all over the place. Besides the fact, and this is my last point, is that when we talk about what a healthy diet looks like, most often there is no mention of cult culture, right? It is my plate, half your plate is non-starchy vegetable, a quarter is starch and a quarter is protein. There are so many ways that that plate could be made up and then when we see images of families eating those foods, more often than not, those are white, able-bodied families, right? So it is layered all over the place. I mean, I feel like I am just, you know, spewing the truth. <laughs> you are. I mean, it's so good. It's so uh, good. I mean, it's, you know, it's terrible, but like, I think you were laying this out in a way that people really need to hear because I think you know, people make so many assumptions about, well, healthy eating is like universal. And then that's kind of it. And, it, you know, everyone should eat X, Y, Z way when in fact, like there are many different ways to be healthy. Um, and you have to think about a person's culture, a person's background, you know, a person's environment and what they need in their environment to thrive. And just like, instead of just blaming somebody for their health outcome. Right. And, you know, I have to say one last thing. So Camilla pointed something out that I think we often forget when we're thinking about restaurants and restaurant industries, this idea of family meal, right? We talk a lot about families eating together in this country, and then we damn people for not engaging in that behavior. This idea of sitting down to a communal meal, there are so many ways that it can happen and so many cuisines and cultures that can be expressed. And most often we forget that when we think about how do you sit down for a family meal, who's your family, right? And what does that meal look like? Absolutely. Um, and I thank you so much for 
saying such like saying such excellent comments i really appreciate it and i'm just want to i'm like basking in that moment because that was that was so good it was so it was it was it's spot on and i think everyone hopefully on this on this call will start to think about and question you know how they think about what healthy looks like and what healthy food looks like and who is healthy and who has access to healthy and really start to question that um, as we all should should be doing um so Dr. Butler, I wanted to address my next question to you um, because I think this, this builds off of um, Maya's point is the fact that kind of how does kind of food and diet culture combined with um, impact um, BIPOC people differently? And for those on the call who are unfamiliar with the term BIPOC means black indigenous people of color in case anyone isn't aware of that term. Um, but so Dr. Butler, how would you say that kind of diet culture and healthy eating, that kind of mentality, how does that impact BIPOC people differently? Definitely. And, and just to kind of bring Maya's point, you know, back into that, I think that was excellent. Um, so when we're talking about health, health is defined by what is healthy by a white man's standard. What do I deem as healthy? Basically, and what do I deem as good as a good enough body based on a white male's perspective? Throughout that, throughout history, the entire diet culture has been created out of what white, white cisgender men have thought about women's bodies, period. And so when we're thinking about kind of like how all of this started, a lot of the rhetoric around kind of how women should shape their bodies, that's been based on getting a thin waist to fit European standards and European standards based on what, what they think is appropriate. And so developing diets, if you look at all of the diets that have been created, they're all by white men. Um, all of them. And so at the, at, I mean, at the overarching, like at the top of all of these things are white men making decisions about what is healthy for people. And so if you're talking about the education that we're eating up around what is healthy, most of that has been fed to us through the lens of diet culture. And so talking about ways that we are supposed to be healthy and engaging with food is really lacking in whole well-rounded nutrition. We're lacking culture. We're lacking kind of things that help us to stay bonded, those factors that help us feel like we're a part of a community. Diet culture comes in and tells us none of that is necessary. And basically what we need to do is thinness is above everything. You need to just forget about all of that. And all that stuff is fed to us from the day that we're born um, because it's been fed to our parents and the people who are taking care of us. And so when you're talking about going on, like people who start to engage in diets, when diets, when people of color engage with diets and, you know, the idea that they're unhealthy is a lot of it is coming from the um, healthcare fields. A lot of it is coming from their providers and kind of like what is being told to them about their bodies. And when they enter into the healthcare industry, black people, people of color are looked at from a lens of what do you need to do to be thin, period. We're not talking about healthy engaging behaviors. We're talking about what do you need to do to be thin? What do you need to do then the way that I hear that and the way that I talk to my clients about it is what do you need to do to be more white? What do you need to do to move away from more of who you are? Um, and so then we're looked at and then we're, we're, we're kind of like have this fear thrown at us around, well, you know, if you don't do this, then you will die. Because again, all of those, that information that Maya talked about, that's what we're hearing. We're hearing black people have this disease. People of color have this disease, but we're not talking about all the other issues that would then make them have to take responsibility for the things that are happening in these communities. And so when we go into the healthcare industry, the thing I remember when I was younger, what I was told was, well, you don't want to get high blood pressure. Like that's the thing that is continuously spread generation to generation. And all I do is associate large body with disease, large body with illness. And so when you're talking about BIPOC people, it's hugely oppressive. So diet culture in and of itself is oppressive. It continues to um, kind of reinforce this white supremacy and that everything of, about who we are, because when you wipe away our culture, when you wipe, wipe away the ways that we bond with each other, when you wipe away our communities, all that is left is a, is, is a body, and then that body isn't good enough if it's not small. So all of who we are is being wiped away for the sake of, you know, the control that they want over our bodies. And I like to talk to my clients about taking that power back and standing in that we can still engage in health-seeking behaviors without focusing so much on diet, without focusing so much on trying to thin our waist out, without focusing so much on what, you know, what the scale says, this antiquated BMI uh, system, right? So all of these things that are going on and just becoming educated about that. So when we're talking about education around diet culture, 
we have to unlearn so much stuff. And we're basically fighting against something that's continuously getting stronger every day. It's getting stronger every day because the, the information isn't going anywhere. So we're trying to fight against it and provide information as to why it doesn't make any sense and why it's oppressive. And to fight against that kind of culture is, is hard. It's super hard, but largely in and of itself, I view it as largely oppressive and it's anti-Black. Diet culture in and of itself is anti-Black, anti-people of color. And so to try to chase that would be to chase, you know, trying to be who you are not. Yeah, I just want to really appreciate what you're saying and the, and the way that you're saying it, right? Food is, food is our most intimate connection to our bodies and to our cultures. And um, for, for immigrants of color too, right? We're, we're forced to separate from that culture and forced to separate from our um, traditional food ways. And that's not, those are not considered healthy ways, even though those have been nourishing for us for generations. And there are, there are so many BIPOC producers and communities that are growing amazing food in really healthy ways and ecological ways and are poised to feed communities but have never had the investment in them uh, to be able to do that, right? So lacking access to the, the policies and structural support and technical assistance that would make it possible to get those amazing collard greens, for example, to a school, right? Where kids could eat that instead. Um, I think that the other thing that's important for us to talk about when we're talking about what the media does in terms of body shaming and our images and things like that is also recognizing that the media simultaneously is targeting BIPOC communities, right? So young black people see at least twice as many ads for junk food than white folks do, right? And that's intentional. And the kind of product placement that's happening, we talked about lack of access to healthy food, but what we're also seeing is an oversaturation of junk food, just as there's over-policing and other kinds of um, uh, in, insidious things that are placed in BIPOC communities, we're, we're, all, we're seeing that with food too, right? That the, 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 the quote unquote cheapest or most affordable things that are in people's communities are food that is intentionally harmful and then it's, we're being told that it's up to the individual to find our way out of that instead of really confronting that our um, taxes are going to fund these terrible foods um, in, our um, in our community. I'd love to chime in on one additional thing, which um, I know is mentioned, but I did want to say more because it was an organization I used to be on the board of wellness in the schools. And the truth is it starts when you're a kid. You know, a lot of the DOE gives a dollar a day as the budget for children, and it's even lower and lower income neighborhoods. Those food patterns and education and access for families and your what you crave all, I mean, they even say it starts in the womb, right? I mean, there's so much scientific evidence that how you're geared towards food happens when you're, you know, when you're being carried in the womb. We're teaching children horrible habits starting in school. And, you know, to Navina's point again, like, how can you ask someone to break through those barriers when they have years and years and years at such formidable ages saying the opposite? You know, we as a country have to also take responsibility at an early stage when you are, you know, when the state is technically in control of what you're eating, multiple meals a day, you know, till a teenage year. Absolutely, that's such a that's such a great point. Um, so I wanted to before we jump into our potential Q and A, um, I would love to ask all of you um, to kind of speak to with everything that we're collectively as a so society dealing with right now: um, racial justice, economic recovery, increasing awareness of the you know very real issues in our food system, in the way that workers are treated, in you know in kind of the realities of how the food system is set up. Um, how will, will all of that, you know, million dollar question, impact how we eat in the future? Are there some lessons from 2020 that you hope will stick or should stick? I open that up to the floor. So um, I thought about this because I, I did want to say something positive, right? Um, I, I'm going to go with what Navinia said, which is this idea of uh, agency within communities, right? And this idea of food sharing and communal gardens and growing together 
and redefining how we look at communities. And I can even say in my little Brooklyn bed where I am, you know, my neighbor on one side brings me Trinidadian food. I hand the neighbor on the other side, you know, greens from the community garden that someone gave me. And I do think that that is a way for us forward. I think that, you know, really I'm, in my experience and in my practice and with the people that I'm interacting with, we're going back to the micro, right? And of course, you know, we want people to vote. We want people to talk about, you know, to get out there and really push our elected officials to make systemic change because to dismantle systemic racism takes a lot. But I do think from the positive perspective, really we're on this macro, right? So it's about the community board in your area, petitioning for rezoning of empty lots. Can it become a community garden? You know, all of that. And that's where I'm going to stay for the hope. <laughs> for the I'm learning. Hold on to that hope. <laughs> I'm, I'm going I'm to hold real tight. Real tight. <laughs> well, that's such a good point, though, especially, you know, it, it ties into what Navina was saying as well in the beginning about kind of what she's been noticing in, in, her, in her communities. And I think, you know, perhaps at the beginning of the pandemic, we were all focused on like, oh, I got to stockpile all this stuff. But I think now as it's gone on longer, you know, like people are more interested in like, as people are like directly interacting with their food much more often, like you were saying, um, you know, people are more willing to share or more willing to pitch in or more willing to try like community based models that maybe they were like, oh, I don't know about this earlier there that had seemed less convenient. I think, I think that's great. Does anyone else have thoughts on kind of what they hope to see? You try to chime in. I think um, people are now sort of taking a more critical look at the ways that uh, food has been kind of uh, taught to us and, and held. I think people are becoming a lot more critical. So I'm hopeful that people will begin to, to kind of keep this, this curiosity going about really what am I being told? What does this mean? And really taking ownership into defined health by terms that feel good to them and their community versus what this larger diet culture is, is, is telling us. And so I'm holding on to that hope um, because I know that as that message gets stronger, the message of diet culture gets even stronger and that becomes harder to fight against. But I'm really hopeful in what I see is that people are questioning the, the people who are making laws about food. People are questioning people's um, intentions and becoming a lot more um, vocal about the things that are happening in their communities around food. So that's my hope. That's great. That's great. I'd dovetail to say, you know, interestingly what you shared about the nutrition community because restaurants really parallel that. It's been determined for as long as I can remember by older white men, you know, and restaurants have a big impact on ingredients people are exposed to, you know, what farms are growing, what we're purchasing, what our governments incentivize, what communities center around. And I agree, I think the great pause has been an interesting reckoning for people to care even where their food is from and what kind of person runs that restaurant or that business? How do they treat their people? How do they think about sustainability? Do they care about what you're putting in your body? And I think my hope is that people will take that forward and really to heart that this is a time as a country, as a person, as a community to decide what you value and to put, you know, all of our income is under strain and under siege, put that where it's gonna matter. Think intentionally about where you purchase from, think about connecting to your farms directly, think about really supporting restaurants that speak to your values and where you identify with the owners and the environment. And again, how they put their money where their mouth is, right? And I think, with that, we can see a change. I think there is steps forward in restaurants, but we still have a huge way to go to have ownership and the environment and, and what restaurants stand for. And again, the food that they're sharing and setting into, you know, main culture. Um, it's a big, it's a big change agent. I think restaurants in a big way. And I think, I hope that the public continues to really, you know, vote, vote but also vote with their dollars in their daily life too as to what, what's important to them. Absolutely, I love that. Yeah, just to um, echo and really appreciate everything that my fellow panelists have said. And I think, um, I think that what we've seen with the most recent uprisings around the country and around the world actually, is that people are, people are done with the status quo, 
right? They're ready for something radically different and they're willing to put their bodies and lives on the line clearly for something different. And what I hope will hold for us through the rest of 2020 and into 2021 and beyond is us just being really clear with each other about what matters, what Camila just said of, you know, what are the values that really drive us and how are we gonna hold that? And how are we gonna take care of each other in this? And, um, you know, as we do that, I really, really do hope that we all have learned enough from the first six months of 2020 that who governs matters um, and that we, uh, we change that for 2021. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all for just this, this incredible discussion and commentary. I feel slightly smarter in your presence. Um, you, you are all fantastic and wonderful um, advocates. And so now I have a, there's a couple of questions from the audience that I'd like us to, to answer before we sign up for the evening. Um, so one of them is for, from Katie. And she asks, it's been a long, it's been, it's long been time to make healthy food affordable for all. How do you think things might change as it relates to cost of healthy food in the near, near future now that many are without an income? I don't know who, I don't know who would. I saw that and I'd love to jump in on that because it's something I'm very passionate about. I mean, someone talked about, you know, the basis of agriculture in this country, follow the money, the tax incentives, the lobbying power. I mean, if, if you know organic accessible farms that cared about you know diversity and how they're growing and how they're interacting with their communities had even a fraction of what the sugar industry has this country would be changed um it's just it the cheaper is because they hold power it's because of historical constructs and we have to fight against that i mean one way to do that is buying more directly to local farms and you know even now especially in the pandemic a lot of restaurants mine included we're partnering with local farms and we're giving it directly to guests you go on the website it's no contact you don't have to worry about being exposed to a farmer's market and we're giving additional ways where people can connect i mean again i think unfortunately a lot of food isn't as cheap as McDonald's and that's a big problem. I mean, we used to get that question all the time at the restaurant is, you know, this is expensive. And I said, well, it's not crap. You know, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but again, with voting and who governs and being, spe you know, being speculative and, and casting doubt on why things are the way they are, the meat industry is another great one. Poultry holds a lot of power in this country, huge, you know, and there's, there are reasons for that and you know we as consumers have to push against that and and be a lot more creative whether it's through home gardens connecting to local communities and farmers honestly ask your favorite restaurants they'll help you get in with their wholesalers um there's a lot of really creative ways but you really do have to do detective work and and the truth is it's not as cheap and it's going to take a long time to undo that I just want to jump in on um, thinking about the other side of the socioeconomic ladder, right? Um, because there is the truth with so many people that are out of work and have reduced incomes. And we've seen a huge increase in emergency food utilization. Uh, we've also seen a huge increase in people subscribing for SNAP benefits, which are the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And so for this subset of our population, you know, in in this country, that's not realistic, right? So it may work when we're thinking about more middle income and people who have some more discretionary dollars. Um, what I have done in the past when I've worked with people who had SNAP was to actually go to CSAs and petition the CSA to accept the SNAP benefits. Um, so that they could use their SNAP dollars there rather than having to use their extra cash or finding the farmers markets in your neighborhoods or the WIC programs that actually will accept the government subsidy. Um, because if we're thinking about, you know, really getting fresh, affordable produce to people who need it a lot, if we all need it, right? But then we wanna make sure that we're using some of those funding streams to show that it matters in that way. The same way that as a dietitian, I take insurance because I know that MNT coding matters, then you know we wanna use some of those federal dollars to show up at farmer's markets and SNAP benefits and so on. That's such a good point. And I have seen, at least in New York, I can't speak to other areas, but I have seen some farmer's markets, thankfully, who do take, take SNAP, which I think is really great. 
um, and a much needed, a first of a much needed stance. Well, and I'd also just want to add one thing, which is we should question why all relief meals are chicken. I also find a big issue with that. 99% of relief meals right now, emergency meals are chicken. So that the poultry industry can lobby for faster line speeds and so on. <laughs> um, yeah, I think just the, just the other side of the, somebody asked a question about the online grocery delivery here too. And um, something for us just all to keep in mind as we're thinking about how we take more action on this is that farms and farmers markets are able to take SNAP at, you know, at the markets, um, many of them because they've done the work to do that. But it's still the case that with online delivery, you can only use your SNAP or your EBT card for Walmart and Amazon. And as we know, Walmart and Amazon are both severely exploiting workers, farmers, the planet. Um, so something that we all need to work on in our respective states is to make it more possible for uh, the businesses that we wanna be supporting and who really bring healthful food to our communities to be able to take that too. Online. That's, that's such a great point. Um, so I have, I think we have time for one more question. Um, there's a good one in here from Jay that I thought I would put in. How will COVID have long lasting impacts on food deserts? For example, does the growth of um, we talked about the online grocery delivery, but kind of like, will it exacerbate health issues if those who live in food deserts can only easily stockpile, you know, highly processed foods? What I've seen, at least in New York, because that's where my, you know, patient population is, is that yes, right? Because we have neighborhoods that have been redlined. And so full service grocery stores have already moved out and dollar stores and corner bodegas are in an abundance. And so what we are seeing also, you know, with these shifts are, you know, and I actually, I don't call it a food desert, I call it a fast food swamp. Um, and it really is food apartheid, right? Because this is a result of structural and systemic racism. So 100%, I absolutely do expect to see, you know, <laughs> unfortunately an increase in non-communicable disease secondary to, you know, limited access to, being able to move your body and nourish yourself in patterns that support and express health. But we have to end on something positive because that's that's too, too down, down, down. Well, I have one more question. I have one more question for you guys. Um, so what, what are some things that people can do today to better support people in the food and restaurant industry who are hurt the most? Kind of like, what are some things we can take kind of our frustration and our anger and our sadness as well and like channel it to helping others? Like what, what are some things that we can do? One thing that I would suggest is, um, so we know that, you know, when those foundational pieces aren't there, our emotional and mental health takes a hit. So there are organizations, mental health organizations who are providing pro bono services to people who are in the food and restaurant industry. And you can connect through inclusivetherapist.com. They have some providers across the country who are providing those pro bono services. Also, if you are a Black a woman or black girl or you have children, then the Loveland Foundation is also providing vouchers for people to um, receive therapy. And so getting those um, that support because I, you know, we talk about income and that's going to affect our emotional mental health. And so be able to donate to those um, organizations is going to be extremely helpful. That's so great. Does anyone, I know we've talked a little bit about, um, Camilla, did you want to mention um, I know you have the restaurant bill in that's kind of in that's the house. House. Yep. So if you go to um, www.saverestaurants.com, we have an auto emailer. It takes literally less than five minutes. If every person on this call emailed their representatives every day for the next two weeks, I think we would actually finally get aid and attention. So hard to say that. And I know it's so frustrating to hear call your representatives and it feels like a drop in the bucket, but I'm telling you there are, they are listening now more than ever, and it does move the needle. In addition, RoarNewYork.org, we've partnered with Robin Hood, and like I said, we're keeping the fund open. We're giving direct cash assistance to restaurant workers who are facing economic hardship. First come, first serve basis, no questions asked. They just get a check. Um, I learned crazy enough, kind of the hard way, it's really hard to just get straight cash in someone's pocket in this country. and at a time when people are home, um, that's what people need. You know, normally we rely, especially in New York, on relief services, you know, emergency food assistance, but a lot of people have a lot of needs um, that 
you know, those support services and or can't leave home um, or caring for someone. So uh, this is the time. Like I said, we've been fortunate enough to raise over a million dollars and we're going to keep it going for as long as this, this is going on. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, if there, if no one else has anything else to add, I'm shocked and amazed that we ended on time. Um, but I thank, thank you all um, to our amazing panelists for this really enlightening and informative hour. I feel so energized and ready to go um, despite it being 6 p.m. on the East Coast. Um, and I hope everybody else who has been on this has joined us this evening slash afternoon has also really enjoyed this this conversation. Um, so thank you all so much and uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next talk. <laughs>